Hello and welcome to Timeless with Julie Hartman. I'm Julie Hartman and it is great as always to be with you. Just a reminder that in addition to my show Timeless, I encourage you to check out my show with Dennis Prager, aptly called Dennis and Julie, which premieres every Sunday at one o'clock Pacific, four o'clock Eastern, right here on this YouTube channel. For those of you who joined us yesterday, you were present for a magnificent conversation with Rabbi Manus Friedman, and we will be continuing part two of that conversation right now. As a quick reminder background of uh, Rabbi Manus Friedman, he's known as the most popular rabbi on YouTube. He's written several books. We have the pictures of three of them right here, Creating a Life That Matters, doesn't anyone blush anymore in the joy of intimacy? Yesterday, we spoke a bit about Rabbi Friedman's upbringing. He was born in 1946 in Czechoslovakia, which, again, please go back to that episode yesterday to watch part one. It was absolutely magnificent. And if you would like to learn more about Rabbi Friedman, please go to his website, itsgoodtoknow.org. And you can also, if you'd like to know more about Rabbi Friedman and yours truly, Purchase this book, Elevator Pitches for God. It's comprised of 71-page essays from a variety of contributors. And in a page or less, in 500 words or less, we all write about why it is that we believe in God. As a quick aside, we don't get a dime from this book, the contributors, that is. The brilliant visionaries of this book, Ron and Bruce, set up a nonprofit in order to make this book. So we who are lucky enough to contribute shout it out, not because we're reaping any kind of financial benefit from it, but because we truly participated in it because it is life-changing. We hope so much that it will be life-changing to you. And I may venture to say I promise it will. And so now we are back for part two with Rabbi Friedman. Rabbi, welcome back to the show. And thank you thank again you so much. for being here. I enjoyed yesterday immensely. Oh, so did I. Just, it was just magnificent, as I said. We were discussing yesterday, among some other things, <laughs> among some other pretty large topics, freedom of choice. And I was struck by how often you kept referring to human beings' freedom of choice. And this is something that plagues me because... In addition to our need to understand why we are here, which is what we discussed yesterday, we also need to contemplate why evil exists. And I often wonder, is the evil in the world because of our free will to make good or bad choices? Or is there, in addition to that, a conscious, animate force of evil, what Christians would call Satan or the devil, that is goading us towards bad decisions? And before I, I hear your, your response to this, Rabbi, I would like to bring up and root this in scripture, the Adam and Eve story, because from my perspective, the Adam and Eve story tells us that evil is a combination of our free will to do bad things and a conscious animate force that's go goading us to do those bad things. Because if we look at that story, God created Adam and Eve and gave Adam and Eve the proclivity to succumb to temptation, that's their free will. But also the serpent was there goading Adam and Eve. And the scripture says that the serpent was the shrewdest of all of the wild beasts that the Lord God created. Genesis says that God created the serpent. In other words, God created evil. And so what is your perspective on this? Are we, do we have full freedom of choice? Or is there also a goader? if you will. Can we talk about Adam and Eve for a minute? We can talk about anything for many minutes. Okay. 
Um, let's take a closer look at the story. <clears throat> if it's a story in the Bible, if it's a story in the Torah, a story that God is telling us, there's got to be so much meaning to it that we would never know what it's telling us if, if God didn't reveal it to us. So if a story sounds a little too simple, a little too pedantic, we're not understanding it correctly. Not, not to change the subject, but there was Joseph and his brothers and they were jealous of his coat. And it turned really negative. Moral of the story, Jacob showed favoritism to, to Joseph and that's what caused all the problems. So we now know that we shouldn't show favoritism. Uh, that is not a biblical story. Hmm. Dr. Phil can tell you that you shouldn't show favoritism. You don't need God to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be so much more to the story. It's too plain. It's too ordinary to be coming from heaven. So let's look at Adam and Eve. The story needs so much commentary because no part of it is understandable. God speaks to Adam up close and personal and says, don't eat from that tree. An hour later, he eats from the tree. <laughs> that is not possible. You cannot talk to God face to face and then ignore him an hour later. Why not? Because he's God. <laughs> Fair enough. If your landlord told you not to do something, you would wait at least a weekend. You don't know who you're talking to. I may not. <laughs> Point taken. It, 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 yeah. It doesn't make sense. When God spoke at Mount Sinai, everyone was, was, was fainting from awe and fear and, and whatever. I like to joke about this, you know. Can you imagine God is speaking to Adam and Adam says, Do you mean me? <laughs> That's right. So 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 why is it that that Adam didn't say that, but Moses did? Because Adam was first in line. What did Moses say? Well, didn't Moses challenge God by saying, uh, why me? Why have you tasked me with revealing your word? Why why didn't Adam challenge God in a similar way? God told Moses that he is going to redeem the Jewish people. Moses said, yeah, for a while. Why don't you just send Moshiach and do it for keeps? <laughs> but God wasn't asking Adam to redeem the people from slavery or exile. And there was nobody else. So it's up close and personal. There's no one else to talk to. So God obviously is talking to you. And you can ignore him an hour later. Something wrong with God. And then, of course, what is wrong with Adam? An hour later? It, it really, it's, it's, it's not a good story. So forgive me. I just want to reorient ourselves because when I'm on uh, my show with Dennis, Dennis and Julie, we call it the tangent hour. And... Mm -hmm. I love tangents, and, and this one was especially worthy, but I just want to bring us back to this this very important question. Did, um, did God create evil? And so yeah, please continue well, with what you were saying about Adam. I just wanted to reorient us. Yeah, and it is, it is an answer to that, to that question as well. Anyway, so the story is full of mysteries, how is it that a perfect human being who had no traumas at birth because he wasn't born, who didn't live in a bad neighborhood and had no bad friends and had no evil inclination until after he ate from the tree? How is it that he could become so corrupt and so embarrassingly 
immature, that when God says, did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat from? He says, she made me do it. This is not believable. And then God asks Eve, what, why did you do this? And she said, the snake tricked me. No self-respect whatsoever. Yes, the snake was the most clever animal, but you're a human being. The snake tricked you. The story just keeps getting worse and worse. Hmm. God says, of all the trees in the garden you may eat, but the tree of knowledge, good and evil, do not eat from it. For the day you eat from it, you will die. Two problems with that. Number one, was death really a threat to someone who was just created? Did he even know what death meant? And number two, what a confusing message. Don't eat from this tree. The day you eat from it, you will die. Not if you eat from it. The day you eat from it, you will die. Oh, so someday I should eat from it? Confusing. Then, when they eat from the tree, God says, because you did this, you will suffer pain in childbirth. By the sweat of your brow, you will make bread. You will have a miserable life. Now, that is completely unacceptable because that was not part of the warning. The warning was, the day you eat from it, you'll die. Now God is saying, oh, no, 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 not just die. First you'll suffer, then you'll die. This is not right. It's not justice. Hmm. The ultimate question is, what is the point of this story? Are you really trying to discourage me? You want me to serve God? And you tell me that the first human being created by God's hand, who had no issues, no problems, and only one commandment couldn't last an hour. And you want me? I do have traumas. I do have issues. I do have bad friends. I do live in a bad neighborhood. And I have 613 ways to mess up. I don't have a chance. <laughs> This is a very discouraging story. So do you believe it's a, what, what is the word I'm looking for, an allegory? Or, or do, you, do you think it's... It's literal. But you need a little background. Before you give that background, can I tell the audience about two things that will really enrich their lives in addition to the background on uh, on, a, on uh, and you, Adam and Eve. And you don't need a snake to convince you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I do want to tell you two things that will really enhance your life. The first is you should really consider right now amidst economic volatility and global uncertainty, investing in gold. Economists warn that massive tax hikes could devastate your IRA and 401k account as the stock market braces for impact. With inflation on the rise and global uncertainty looming, it's clear why central banks and savvy Americans are turning to gold. If you haven't had your eye on gold, it's time to make it a priority. And that's why you should consider calling Priority Gold to find out how they can help you diversify your savings with physical gold and silver. Call 1-800-405-GOLD or visit PriorityGold.com slash golden for a free gold information guide. Plus, see if you qualify for free shipping and storage. Experts agree that physical gold is one of the best ways right now to fortify your savings no matter the economic climate. Act now to get your portfolio working for you while the market is golden. Call 1-800-405-GOLD to speak with a gold specialist or visit PriorityGold.com slash golden to learn more. That's 1-800-405-GOLD. And in addition to gold... Another thing you may want to consider is investing in some good products that will help you sleep better, like a my pillow, or that'll help you walk better, like my slippers, or that will dry you off faster, 
like my towels. And right now, my pillow is having a massive discount on all of these products. They're having a $25 extravaganza. Two pack multi use my pillows, just $25. My pillow sandals, just $25. Six pack towel sets for $25, brand new four pack dish towels for, you guessed it, just $25. And for the first time ever, the premium my pillows with all new Giza fabric, just $25. Orders over $75 will receive free shipping. Just go to mypillow.com and use the promo code Hartman or call 1 800 566 6745 today and use the promo code Hartman. So back to some light topics here. <laughs> Did God create evil? <laughs> this story is going to blow your mind. I'm Let's ready. Let's back up a little bit. Okay. Before Adam and Eve are created into the physical world, they are two souls in heaven. And God says to them, I need you to go down to the lowest world and elevate it and refine it and make it into the godliest of all worlds. They didn't like the idea, but if God wants, then that's what they do. They open their eyes, and they're in the Garden of Eden. And God says to them, of all the trees in the garden you may eat, but the tree in the center of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, do not eat from it, for the day you eat from it, you will die. Now, Adam and Eve were the smartest people ever. They knew everything. They didn't have the restrictions that we have because they were not born. They were created. And so they were created in a perfect state. By the way, they were physically 20 years old at creation. They were not created as fetuses or infants. Like the rest of the world, they were created mature. The trees were mature. The earth was mature. They were mature. Mm -hmm. So they're sitting there, and Adam is puzzled. Doesn't understand. Something doesn't make sense. All the trees you may eat from means that they're all fine. They don't need elevation or, or repair. There's one tree that needs repair because there's something wrong with it, but we're not allowed to eat from it. What happened to our job? We were sent here to elevate the world and repair it and make it the highest world instead of the lowest world. How do we do that? The one thing that is bad in this world, we're not allowed to eat. So how do we fix it? Didn't understand. The other problem he had was, what is this mixed message? Don't eat from it. The day you eat from it, you die. So Eve said, it is not a mixed message. It's not confusing. It's choice. God is saying, I'm giving you a choice. Don't eat from the tree and live forever or eat from the tree and die he wants us to choose. So Adam said, okay, then let's not eat from it and live. Eve said, he wants us to eat from it. God is giving us a choice, but he wants us to eat from it. Adam said, how in the world do you know that? She said, our job is in the lowest world. This isn't the lowest world. In this world, no one dies. This is not the lowest world. There's a world in which people die. If we eat from the tree, we will go down to that world, and that's where our job is waiting for us. So he wants us to eat from it. Adam said, wow, that's, that's insightful. So they ate. 
Now God comes and says to Adam, you ate from the tree I told you not to eat from. We all imagine God is angry. <laughs> we think God is always angry. God wasn't angry. God was impressed and marveling. How did you know to eat from it? He said, I didn't know. She knew. She told me. So God says to Eve, how did you know? She says, I heard what the snake said, and it made sense. What did the snake say? You're not just going to die. You're going to become like God, and you will know the difference between good and evil. Well, that sounds like a job. There's good and there's evil. Well, you got to clean it up. You got to make it all good. That's where our job is. So bottom line, Adam and Eve did not sin. They were not tempted. They were not, they were not uh, overcome with passion. They were there to serve God properly. And they did. And it was magnificent. So our grandmother Eve understood the whole plan and had the confidence that if we go down into the lowest world, we will be able to fix it. The lowest world is a world of mortality. Now, once they ate from the tree, God comes and says, thank you, that was so good. Let me tell you more about this world that you volunteered to elevate and to fix. There's pain, there's struggle, there's resistance. The earth will not produce food easily, not in the world outside the Garden of Eden. And the snakes, you know, snakes outside the Garden of Eden don't speak and they're not that clever. Outside the Garden of Eden, you do not give birth within an hour of conception. It'll take nine months. Everything will be different down there in this lowest world. So what makes this world so low? Not sin. It was created to be the lowest world. A world in which God is not evident. In a world where God is not evident, you have the freedom to ignore him, to hate him, to remain completely unaware of him. Now, why would God do that? Why give us freedom of choice? We'll only get ourselves into trouble. So here's an important thing. We have very limited freedom of choice. It's a great gift, but it's very limited. Yes, it like, is. You, you don't have freedom of choice of when you want to be born or when you want to die or to whom you want to be born or in which generation you want to be born or which gender you're going to be born. All these huge things, you have absolutely no say in it whatsoever. God decides, puts you in a context and then gives you freedom of choice to do good or to do bad. Why does he put you in a context, though? You're totally because right. I mean, this, this point is so important. We have free will, but it's limited. And it's limited even just in how we get here. You mentioned the time, the place, the parents, the gender. But even once we're here, and, and this can be a, a dangerous road to go down, but nevertheless, it has merit. There are elements of your upbringing that can scar you that you can't control. There are, you know, sure. we, we, we do have limited free will. But, but back to this very important question, why did God place us here in this context with our limited free will? See, every context, we have 8 billion people, we have 8 billion contexts. In every one of those contexts, 
there is a potential godliness that can elevate the world and rid the world of the evil and bring the world to godliness. So no two people are doing the same thing because no two contexts are exactly the same. So you're born in a certain country, you're raised in a certain country, your job is to do something good in that country. That's the big picture. You're born in a certain house, in a certain neighborhood, in a certain apartment, and you live there because that's where God needs you to deposit your godliness. And if all 8 billion people do their job, the world will become absolutely divine, much greater than heaven. Forgive me, I'm with you on so much. And this is, part one was magnificent and part two is already magnificent. I'm with you on so much. What I don't understand is why. And I know we, we spoke about this yesterday. It's the most fundamental and mysterious question of our existence. Why? But yes, we all have to deposit our godliness. Yes, we're all born in different contexts. Yes, our our getting here is a miracle and there must be some reason why we are here. But, but why, in my previous words, why even put us in this rugby scrum? If God's God and God can create anything... Why even put us in this world where it's our task to deposit our godliness? Why even put all of us through that in the first place? So we spoke about this yesterday. What God is after is a relationship. Hmm. It is not good to be alone. That's a godly impulse. That's really applying that to marriage. You don't get married unless you're perfect, which means unless you decide enough about me, I'm as good as I'm going to get. I don't care anymore. There's, it's time to introduce another face into my life. That's when you get married. So in a certain sense, you get married when you're perfect. But then if you're perfect, why do you need to get married? When you're perfect, you are impressively capable. But what's good about it? If you lived in the, alone on an island and you could take care of yourself, you can feed yourself, you can protect yourself, you can do everything. But what's good about it? Where's the goodness? Goodness doesn't begin until there are two people. So to be good, there has to be someone to be good to. And what is good? Good means I'm, I'm not enough. Just me? What's the point? What's the point? God creates the world with a point, with a purpose that is very important to him. Now, we need to have the option of responding to him or not responding to him so that we are meaningful. If he creates us all godly and loving him and adoring him, then it's his love being reflected back. It's not our love. In order for God to have our love, he has to give us the freedom not to love him. Then when we do love him, it's our love that he's getting, not his own love. So if he made us love him, it would be his love, not ours. And that's the only area in which we really need to have freedom of choice. We don't need freedom of choice to decide which house to buy. If God decided it would be much better, which business to go into, why would God give us the choice when he can make so much better choices? The only place where there is a value to our having free choice is in responding to him. That is so romantic. 
the ultimate free choice that a husband and wife have is not where to live, how to live, how to dress, how to raise the children, how to make a living. All of that is is not really free. There are too many influences that drive you to do what you do. The one area in which you are truly free. Are you going to respond to me or are you going to remain focused on yourself? That's it. That's the freedom of choice. So what is God after? God is after a relationship. Where can he have that relationship? In the lowest world where he is not obvious. Because if he's obvious, there's no freedom of choice. So the world is low, not because we ruined it. The world is low because it was created to be ungodly so that it allows freedom of choice. Our job is to change that, to make God more obvious in this world than he is in heaven. So here's the conclusion. Evil means you have the option of not cooperating. Doesn't mean you have to be evil in in, in a dark, uh, malevolent sense. Evil begins in the fact that you don't have to recognize him. Now, when that deteriorates into spitefulness, into vengefulness, into anger, and and well, that that's that's uncalled for. That's sin. But the fact that we are not naturally conscious of God, that's not a sin. That's the world God created. With our wisdom and with our freedom of choice and with God's instructions in the Torah, we can choose the right way to partner with him in making this world more godly. Like people are very devoted these days to tikkun olam, make the world better, go out there and improve the world. Very, very good. But take into account, whose world are you fixing? Anything you do that makes life more livable on earth serves God's purpose. Because it's his world that we're fixing. So it's very nice that you want to fix the world, save the world, clean up the world. Good. But be aware of whose world you're fixing. So I got this beautiful example of a Japanese gardener who just loves flowers and loves beauty. And he sees this neglected lawn. So without asking any questions, he goes and he fixes it. He turns it into a beautiful garden. Suddenly, some guy shows up and hands him a check. He says, what is this? The guy says, that lawn, it's beautiful. It's my lawn, so I owe you. We are fixing God's lawn. In everything we do that is productive and useful, we are making God's lawn more beautiful. So any guy who complains... I go to work in this assembly line. It is so boring. It is so dull and so deadening. What I, I need something meaningful in my life. If you're producing toothbrushes, you are serving God. If you're producing sliced bread, you're definitely serving God. <laughs> definitely. All right. Well, Whoever invented the electric toothbrush has has a secured place in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I think because, whoever invented pizza has an even more secure place in heaven. But we can battle yeah, that. Except for those who got sick from eating too much. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, the point of it is, anything we do that makes life more livable, we are serving God's purpose. It's not a dull, meaningless routine. You're serving God. Do it with a little uh, enthusiasm. 
So we are exactly where God needs us to be, the context, going back to that. And here's where the choice of good and evil comes in. The real good or evil is not killing or not killing, stealing or not stealing, uh, committing adultery or not committing adultery. The Ten Commandments says, just don't even consider those things. Forget about that. Let's talk about more meaningful things. Like, is this life about you or is this life about your creator? Do you have the needs and those needs need to be fulfilled? Or does God have a need and needs you to fulfill them? Are you needy or are you needed? That's where good and evil separate. Good means you recognize that you are needed. Evil means you think you're needy. <laughs> Psychologically, even without religion, without God, Psychologically, if you focus on how needy you are, you're headed for a depression. You're making your life a misery. We should not be needy. I didn't ask to be born means I don't need this. I need to eat. Who did this to me? I need to sleep half my life. Who did this to me? I need protection. I need a house. I need a roof over my head. Who did this to me? I don't like it. Because it's not my need. It's my handicap. Can't go for too long without some food. Can't live without breathing. Who did this to me? So to call it my need is a mistake, and it makes us depressed. I don't want to be needy. It's not natural for me to be needy because I didn't ask to be born. I don't need to be born. So if life is beautiful, I love it. I don't need this. When I start to feel like I need, I'm making myself anxious. I'm making myself desperate. I'm making myself sick. Human beings in their, in their most mature and, and healthy state need nothing. Well, one thing. I need to know who needs me. That's all. Tell me what you need from me. You say to God, tell me what you need from me and I'm fine. Because I don't need anything. So a God who needs me is the only, the only sensible God, the only reasonable God. If he needs nothing, then count me out. I don't want to put up with all this stuff if he doesn't even need it. So psychologically, and it took a long time for us to discover this. I don't know why. I would much rather be needed than needy. I'd much rather make lunch for you than for myself. I feel so much better when I do what you need than when I do what I need. And yet pop psychology says, take care of yourself, validate yourself, love yourself, do for yourself. <laughs> You're making us crazy. That's right. The new psychology is Humans need nothing as long as they know who needs them. That's, that's, the, a new, whole new world. <laughs> that's the new psychology, but that's also the old one. And we're trying to yes. we're trying to resurrect it as the new one. Rabbi Friedman, it's been such a joy and an honor. And I thank you very much for using your context you, that God placed you in to do what you do with your life. You're doing pretty good yourself. Well, thank you. I hope to welcome you back onto the program in the future. And in the meantime, I'll be watching your YouTube channel, <laughs> which is utterly fantastic. 
Thank you so much again, Rabbi. I wish you all the best. Thank you for the opportunity to make the world a little bit better. I hope we've done that. I think we have. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. And thanks to all of you, as always, for watching. I hope that that was as enriching for you as it was for me. And before we go, I want to tell you again about something that really will be enriching to you. Please consider investing in gold. Right now is a time of enormous economic and global uncertainty. Economists warn that massive tax hikes could devastate your IRA and 401k account as the stock market braces for impact. With inflation and the rise of global uncertainty looming, it's clear why central banks and savvy Americans are turning to gold. If you haven't had your eye on gold, perhaps it's time to make it a priority. I'm Julie Hartman, and I urge you to consider calling Priority Gold to find out how they can help you diversify your savings with physical gold and silver. Call 1-800-405-GOLD or visit PriorityGold.com slash Golden for a free gold information guide. Plus, see if you qualify for free shipping and storage. Act now to get your portfolio working for you while the market is golden. Call 1-800-405-GOLD to speak with a gold specialist, or visit PriorityGold.com slash Golden to learn more. That's 1-800-405-GOLD. Please let me know what you think about today, yesterday, and any thoughts that undoubtedly will arise from these conversations. You know, you can always email me at julie at julie-hartman.com. I love hearing from you. Take care. I'll see you soon.